So with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 12, if you're brand new to all this, fifth book of the Old Testament. So Genesis, then turn right, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now Deuteronomy. We're looking at Deuteronomy 12 and 13, title of our study tonight, Seven Ever-Present Dangers. We're going to be digging into some issues that were a serious problem back in that day. That would be the days of Moses. In fact, these are the last days of Moses. This is his last sermon. And so if at any time you think, I'm going a little long in the study, consider this. He read from chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book. And in those days, when you read the scripture, the reader would sit and the people would stand. I can't imagine what it would be like. I, I, anyway, it's just good that we're doing it this way. But um, in any case, we're, we're going to be looking at those seven ever-present dangers. And there's going to be all sorts of practical application for us. But I'll give you the seven in a word. Idolatry. I well, can't do the second in a word. Every man doing what's right in his own eyes. If you have a word for, oh, stupidity. Um, third, altering God's word by adding to or taking away from it. And I came up with the word for that, plagiarism. And uh, if you've never heard of it, it's like plagiarism, only not. Plagiarism, of course, it's in the news. Famous people, they get material from someone else. They publish it as if it were their own. They use it for a major doctrinal thesis or something. And then they get busted. Well, this is nothing like that. It's the opposite of that because this is actually taking God's word, altering it, and then saying it's still his word. And that's what Satan tried to do, you see. That's what he was successful in doing against Eve, unsuccessful, of course, against Jesus. You want to make sure he's never successful against you. When the word of God is altered, well, whatever's still his is true. But you are aware, and if you weren't, you will be now, that, that it's possible to make something say the opposite of what it actually intended to say simply by changing two or three words around. That's how Satan did it. It was a problem then. It's a problem now. And so that's altering God's word by adding to or taking away from it. These words are going to appear in the text, so I'm just kind of laying it out for you. Fourth will be the prophets. Those first three, by the way, in the first um, chapter we're looking at, chapter 12, it's lengthier, but we'll spend hopefully about balanced time in them. Uh, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh are all in our second chapter, and that's chapter 13, where we look at prophets, false and true, dreamers, false and true, and then signs and wonders. Those are the seven things we'll be considering together. So chapter 12, first few verses we read, these are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains, on the hills, under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods, destroy their names from that place. This is the first danger. It's fail, failure to obey, and in this case, failure to destroy the idols of the enemies because that would lead God's people ultimately to idolatry. So, so he's saying, when I take you in and you see all the different ways they worship and all the places they worship and all the things they worship with, their altars, their sacred pillars, their wooden images, I want you to tear them down, cut them down, burn them out, just get rid of them. Verse four, he says, you shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. So not in that place, not in that way, and never their gods, small g, always 
because, well, they're not actually gods, but you shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. You shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, which you vowed. Offerings, your free will offerings, the, the first born of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households in which the Lord your God has blessed you. It's fairly easy to see it. And I encourage you, if you, if you only have one Bible and you don't wanna mark it up, I understand that. Early on, I'm using, you know, a, a nice leather Bible now, and, and it's, you know, there's no real room to write in it. But early on, when I was first studying and teaching, I got a hardback Bible because I like to write notes in the margins. Now, the margins were tiny, so the notes are minuscule. I could actually see them back then. But, uh, and, and that's all I had when I taught. Now and then I'd put something on a post-it, you know, some joke I heard or something I wanted to make sure I remembered. But mostly I just read the scripture. I put little references and, and that was sufficient. Well, that's been a while. So all, all I'm saying is having had that because it was a hardback and because I was using it as a, as a prep tool and a, a teaching tool, I started highlighting things. And at some point, maybe, maybe in Peter, maybe beyond, but some point in our Sunday studies, I'm gonna spend a little time with you and, and kind of lay out how I actually did that because it's a super good way to see what's actually there. Now I'm doing a lot of this on the computer, so it's a lot easier, but something's lost and not having to do it the slow labor some way and uh, looking up every scripture and reading through it. But anyway, here's, here's what you find if you did just what I'm doing now, which is this highlighting in, in those days, I would highlight every reference to God in blue, dark blue, and, and uh, just when it said G-O-D, and when it said Lord, and then I had another color for that, and then when it said Spirit, I had a color for that. They all showed me, hey, this is God the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. I had a color for sin. I always used red, because it reminded me that the blood of Christ is the only thing that can cleanse me from my sin. And there were others, but now, I'm just going to read what I have and I'll tell you how many I'll, I'll tell you how many times and places it is and all I did was not, and it's you know so easy I'm ashamed of it but but I just bolded it you know so in verse verse 1 it says you shall be careful to observe uh, in verse two, you shall utterly destroy. And, and uh, later in it, you shall dispossess. But the key words here again, you shall, you shall, you shall. Verse three, you shall destroy their altars. You shall cut down the carved images. Verse four, you shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Verse five, you shall not. Oh, but you shall, excuse me, in verse five, seek the place where the Lord your God chooses. So uh, then latter part of verse seven or beginning, you shall eat before the Lord. And later in that verse, you shall rejoice in all to which you've put your hand. And, and so you, if you were to do what I'm saying, just look for, repeated words, because they're important. If he uses them over and over and over, they're important. And so I didn't count them, but there are a lot you shalls and a couple you shall nots. Well, beginning at verse eight, there are more you thou shalt nots or you shall nots. And so uh, we pick up in, in verse eight. And, and the first the first warning there was against idolatry. That was the first of the seven ever-present dangers because the idea of worshiping anything God created or anything you made out of something God created or anything that you love more than you love the Lord. Listen, the ocean is so beautiful. Just spent two weeks down there. And, and, and it, it's like, I love it so much. If you're not an ocean person, you just can't begin to understand. But, you know, there are people that love the rivers that way or they love the mountains that way. And, and it's okay to love the stuff God made, just not to love it the way you love him. 
it. You love it like you love people because they were made by him and we're to love one another as Christ has loved us. And we can enjoy his creation without idolizing it, without making it a God small g. And of course, that's happening in our culture. You know this, you're aware of it. People have whole movements based on the idea that Mother Earth's getting mad and we better do something to calm her down or whatever they're calling her today. Listen, there's no Mother Earth. There's just one Earth, the one God created. God created the heavens and the Earth. Well, then the second of the seven, after, after idolatry, because again, failure to obey and destroy the enemy's idols would lead them to ultimately worship those idols. Now, they didn't believe it, but they ended up, not all of them, but some of them doing it. The second is doing it the world's way. That leads to every possible abomination. And the key phrase is right here in verse 8. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. This is fleshed out for us when we get to the book of Judges. And that's just a couple books ahead. Because there are seven cycles where God blesses his people. And they're worshiping him and enjoying him. And then all of a sudden, they kind of get complacent and they begin to, well, compromise or, or worship things around them, put too much emphasis on something he made instead of the maker himself. And so when that happens, when, when they sinned against him, he would bring an enemy. And the enemy would take them captive. And there in captivity, ultimately, they would cry out to him. And because he's gracious and merciful and kind and loving, he would redeem and rescue them and bring them back into the land where the whole process began again. It's seven times this happens in the book. Five, seven cycles of five things. Worship, complacency, or idolatry, uh, judgment, pen, repentance, crying out to the Lord, forgive me, heal me, bring us back. And then, then his gracious return and blessing back in the land. So, um, I want to say that what happened to them in the book of Judges is happening in the USA today. It's, it's leading an entire generation that was birthed with the idea that this nation was founded by God, that it was a place where, where men could worship. They didn't have to worship him but they had opportunity to worship him. It wasn't a government controlling religion, but it was freedom to exercise your religious beliefs. And uh, today it's turned around. It's supposed to be freedom from religion. That's what the government's trying to protect us from the only thing that's good for us. And that's a right relationship with God. And so in any case, what happens for us today, we see this generation and I don't mean the younger people, I mean the entire generation, because people of every age have bought a lie. And uh, again, the key words in this section are, you shall and you shall not. Well, we continue on then. Every man doing what's right in his own eyes. He says, don't do that. Verse 9, for as yet you have not come to the rest and in the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so you dwell in safety, and there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, tithes, heave offerings of your hand and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levite who is within your gate, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourselves, verse 13. Here's a warning, so we, um, we want to pay attention to it. We don't offer burnt offerings, but that was just simply an offering of consecration. If you get up in the morning and say, Lord, I just want all you 
all you have for me today. I just want to hear your voice and, and walk in fellowship with you and be fruitful for you and useful to you, glorifying to you. If that's how you start the day, well, then it's important that, that we see it. So he says, um, let's see, take heed that you do not offer, verse 13, your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses. In one of your tribes, there you may offer or you shall offer your burnt offerings. There you shall do all that I command you. However, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates, whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. The unclean and clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike, only you shall not eat the blood. This prohibition will be repeated again and again and again. And he doesn't leave us to wonder, well, is it because it was unhealthy or just gross? Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to London, but they love like blood sausage there. It's, I'm not a fan. But uh, anyway, they're like, you got to taste this. I'm like, I do. And uh, anyway, he, I, I should have just showed him the scripture that, hey, I can't do it. They were smart, though. They would have known this is Old Testament. But he says, you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it out on the earth like water. You may not eat it within your gates, the tithe of your grain or your new wine or your oil or the firstborn of your herd or your flock or any of any of your offerings which you vow of your free will offerings or of the heave offering of your hand. Now, there's something subtle here, but it's, it's important to us. And this is it. A free will offering was just that. It wasn't required by God. But once you offered it, it was regulated by his word. And that's how things are today. See, before you gave your life to the Lord, you just lived the life, the way, your life, the way you wanted. You got up in the morning and thought, what do I want to do today? Where do I want to go today? I was the whole deal. But now that you're his, you're supposed to get up and say, Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want to do in me and through me and, and well, all the people around me? So, like, dedicating yourself to the Lord, he didn't make you do it. Did you know there's no draft in the Christian army? We're soldiers for Christ, but he didn't draft us. We all signed up. And if you're like, I didn't sign up, well, you should do that tonight. You should make sure before you leave this place, you enlist in the Lord's army. But, but understand this, before you're fighting for the Lord, and we don't fight with the same weapons of the world, our weapons are spiritual, not carnal. But, but any point, it's first you have to be a child alive in Christ Jesus, a child of God. Then you grow in the Lord, and then you serve and represent the Lord. It doesn't take as long as growing up physically, because if it did, we'd be in real trouble. Uh, there would be so many, you know, 10-year-old baby Christians, although there are some. So uh, again, not regulated, I mean, not required, but always regulated. So all we do must be in accordance with his word. So we're looking for application always. We, we don't just want to say, well, what did this mean to them? It meant exactly what it said. But what does it mean to us? It means that when we dedicate ourselves to the Lord, when we get up and say, Lord, I am yours, what do you want me to do? That we trust that he is going to lead us through that day. And, and here's one thing I've experienced, and I'm sure some of you have as well, if not all of you. You get up, and you dedicate the day to the Lord, and you're like, Lord, just get me through this one, and let me glorify you in it. And you get in your car, and you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, bup, 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 bup. you've heard that sound before, right? Flat tire. It's no fun. But it's pouring rain and all that stuff, and, and, and you're like, Lord, come on. How could this be a part of your plan? Well, it's easy. Somebody's going to come to get you and help you with that tire. There's somebody who might actually be in need of prayer. There's someone who might actually need someone to tell them there's a God who loves them and, 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 and share your testimony. You've got them. When, when they show up, hope you have AAA. I highly recommend them. I rarely you know, recommend products, but California Association of Automobile. So it's actually CSAA now, but AAA, they do a great job. 
pay a little bit of money. They tow you as many times as you need, except if you t get towed way too many times. How do I know that? Experientially, when Pam and I were real young and all we had was VWs, we had VW bugs, we had Baja bugs, we had square backs, we had fast backs, we had buses, VW buses, we had the, n never any of the newer stuff. All of it looks, I wish I had any of those now. I buy them for $5,000 back then, they're worth $50,000 now. So if you got one in your garage or in your, you know, wherever you might have it. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time there, but I do want to say that, that those, those things, well, I had AAA, and, and uh, we, we, when we lived in Laguna, we did good because there's a lot of hills, and all I had to do was park in a hill, and the car would always start. Because all you have to do, and if you're unaware, if you've only driven, you know, an automatic, a stick shift, all you have to do is be on a hill, take the clutch out, you know, pop, take the, the brake down, put it in first or second gear, and then uh, let it start rolling. As soon as you get rolling, you just pop the clutch and starts right up. Problem is when you're on flat land. So eventually, we were, were using AAA so many times, they canceled us. I, I tell the guys who come and help me now because I don't see them that often, but uh, you know, batteries die, things still happen, right? And so I tell them, yeah, I, I got canceled by you guys once. Pam and I had an experience just, I don't know, I think it was just yesterday or it could have been the day before. Feels like a long time ago either way. But we had an appointment with somebody and they were, we were looking for some help in an area where we, we were kind of ignorant and it was important that we got some insight into it. So we went to talk to them. And, uh, and, and after they got us in there and we're sitting with the guy, we're, we're like, here's what's going on and here's what we need to know. And he says, well, I, I can't help you at all with that. And, and I'm like, okay, well, we're here, though. And, and, and then it's, it's like, well, tell us a little about yourself. We start a conversation with them pretty soon. We're talking about the Lord. We're talking about church. He's talking about visiting. I don't have the best eyesight. I expect I'll see him this weekend. I really do. It, it turns out, and he said it at the end. He goes, well, isn't this weird? You came here so I could help you, but it turns out, you're helping me. I'm thinking God brought you so that we could have this conversation because I've been thinking about going back to church and I didn't really know where I should go. No, I just feel like it has to be Calvary because you're the ones who are sitting here talking to me about these things. So I'm using that illustration because it's so fresh. It's not something that happened to me like the, the VW years. Those are decades behind me. It's been all Toyota and their upper uh, brands since then. But anyway, all of that brings me to, well, something. Uh, am I at verse 18? Does anybody know? No? Yes? How many say verse 18? Oh, really? 17? No, that's not possible. I mean, I turned the page. But no, okay, let me look and see. None of the accursed things. Uh, no, look, that, that's not it. That can't be it. See, I have a, this is the problem of not just using the notes in your Bible. 17. Oh, no, I read it to you, but I'll read it again because I kind of liked it. You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or new wine or oil of the firstborn of your herd or flock. And of your offerings, which you vow of your free will offerings, of the heave offering of your hand. Again, not required, but regulated. That was the point. Verse 18, you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place. So he gives us the what and the where, which the Lord your God chooses you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite who is within your gates and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all to which you put your hands. I like this because he's making sure that they know that everyone who could be in the household, they're all to be in fellowship when it comes to him. So take heed, verse 19, to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. And when the Lord your God enlarges your border as he's promised you, and you say, let me eat meat. Because you long to eat meat, you may eat as much meat as your heart desires. If the place your Lord God chooses to put his name is too far from you, 
then you may slaughter from your herd or flock which the Lord has given you just as I've commanded you and you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires just as the gazelle and the deer are eaten so you may eat them. The unclean and the clean alike may eat them. What he's doing is, is separating out the sacrifices that they will bring to him when they come to worship uh, and, um, and, and they gather for the, the yearly feast and festivals. There'd be seven ultimately, and, and, but three were required. And, and when they came, they would offer sacrifices. Some of that went to the priest. Some of it was consumed like a burnt offering. You get the idea, consumed completely. And... Um, but beyond that, there was some of it that they got to take and eat with their families and celebrate. This is when they're far away. It's not a feast uh, day or time. And he's just saying, hey, when you're hungry, slaughter something and, and barbecue it up and enjoy it. Just make sure, verse 23, only be sure that you do not eat the blood for the blood is the life. You may not eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it on the earth like water. You shall not eat it, that it may go well with you and your children after you when you do what's right in the sight of the Lord. We're still, see, in that section where, where every man was doing what was right in their own eyes. And he's saying, here's how I want you to do this. Here's where I want you to do it. Here, ultimately, he'll tell them when he wants them to do it. And he's saying, I want you to do it because this is right. Not in the sight of men, not in your own opinion, but in the sight of the Lord. Only the holy things, verse 26, which you have in your vowed offerings, you shall take and go to the place which the Lord chooses. You shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat, the blood on the altar of the Lord your God. The blood of your sacrifices shall be poured on the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all these words. I have those highlighted because they're big. Observe means to pay close attention to, to understand, to keep them in mind, and then obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever. When you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. And that's the key, you see. They lived in a time where every man what was doing was doing what was right in their own eyes. And that's just unacceptable to the Lord. We need, need to do what's right. This is something we have in common with Israel. They had to do what's right. We have to do what's right. But not what we can agree might be right, but what the Lord says is actually right and good. Verse 29, when the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you're not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire of their gods saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it and you shall not add to it nor take away from it. This is sort of the key to that particular section. That's the third idolatry, every man doing what's right in his own eyes, then altering God's word by adding to it or taking away from it. Key phrases here, and you can check them out. You shall and you shall not. But don't miss this because when people are like, why would God have them destroy all those people? Because the way they lived was such an abomination to them. Even offering their children on the altars to Molech and other gods. Burning their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. He says, don't be following that example. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe 
it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. We know that's exactly what Satan did. He added to the word. He changed a word here or there. He took away from it, left stuff out. But he did all that to tempt Eve, and it worked. He did that to tempt Jesus, and it didn't work. The difference between Jesus and Eve, not just that he was the son of God and God the son. I mean, it's got to be helpful, but, but it was because there was nothing in him that wanted to sin. When Eve was enticed, she saw the tree was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. A tree desirable to make one wise. That's the pride of life. First John warns us about those three specifically. Next, we come to the fourth and fifth. And that will be prophets and dreamers. And it's here in chapter 13, verse 1. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, that will be the sixth and seventh. So our last four all appear to us in this one verse. And then he fleshes those out for the rest of this relatively short chapter. So um, he's, he's saying... If a prophet or dreamer of dreams comes and gives you a sign or a wonder, the sign of the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke saying, let us go after other gods. So he shows you something miraculous. And then he says, hey, we got to go worship these other gods, which you've not known and let us serve them. Verse three, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is oh so important. He's testing. God never tempts us to sin, but he does allow the enemy to do so. And the enemy wants to take us down. God tests us, but it's always, always so we can learn from the test. If we pass it, we're gonna be, we're gonna know that. And we're gonna be rejoicing in him. If we fail it, we're gonna learn from it. But he is warning them about false prophets who claim to speak for the Lord. Who, by the way, says of them, Jeremiah 23, 21. If you're a note taker, note jotter, serious student, I encourage you to, to do just that. Have a little pad or something. Jot things down. Jot questions down. Jeremiah 23, 21. I've not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I've not spoken to them. Yet they prophesied, but if they had stood in my presence and caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. What's he saying? These guys never heard from me. They're saying, thus says the Lord. But they're not speaking for me because they never stood. I never spoke to them. I didn't give them this message. That's the way it is with the false prophet. Well, what about a true prophet? God, they stand in his presence. God speaks to them. They come saying, thus says the Lord. And it turns out what they share is exactly what the Lord gave them to share. He says in verse four, picking up on this theme of you shall or you shall not, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. That are, those are six clear and concise commands. But he says, that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your Midst. So idolatry, every man doing what's right in his own eyes, now altering God's word by adding to or taking away from it, and then false prophets and dreamers. Now this is important. There are only two kinds of prophets. There are those who are true and faithful to the word of God, and then there are false prophets. And as we go through the, the history of the Old Testament, Israel in the Old Testament. And, and if you hang with us, come every Wednesday night. We're going to walk all the way, Lord willing, or 
well, it'd be good if he came back before I got to Malachi. But if he decides to hesitate or, or wait, we know he only waits for one reason. It's not his will any perish, but that all come to repentance. So if I have the opportunity and the privilege of going all the way one more time through the Old Testament, we're going to see over and over and over this theme fleshed out for us. That, that a true prophet will come saying, thus says the Lord. And the false prophet will say, that's not what the Lord says. Uh, you know, the false prophet will, will say, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's saying. So the, the true prophet will say, thus says the Lord, repent. Or thus says the Lord, rejoice in the trial you're in. And the, the, the false prophet's going to come and say, hey, listen, just don't worry, be happy, right? Everything's going to be all right. Uh, the false prophet always lies. The true prophet always tells the truth. So just note it. And, and as you're reading through, all these things will be helpful. When, when somebody says something and someone says the opposite, all you have to do is figure out which of these is in accordance with what we know about God. His nature, his character, his commands, his warnings. Because his true prophets warned the people when they were in danger of stumbling and sinning against the Lord or when they were involved in sinning against the Lord and they brought comfort and hope when they were in captivity, when, when they were suffering the, the results of their own sins. So um, the dreamers, by the way, because he mentions both, prophets and dreamers. Joseph is one who had dreams. Many of you are familiar with this story. It's back in, in Genesis, takes up a huge section of the latter part of Genesis. And he shared his dreams with the people who, uh, well, his brothers and, and others who were all around him. And, and his dreams, uh, well, they, they painted pictures for them. And in one of his dreams, he saw all, you know, his, he was like a sheaf in the field and there, they were like the others and said, your sheaves bow down to my sheaf. And listen, the brothers could interpret dreams. They had the gift of interpretation. And so they, they say, so we're going to bow down to you. And later he has a dream and, 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 he, and he sees not just them, but father and mother doing the same. And dad's not happy about that either. It leads to them selling him into slavery, which leads to him in Egypt and he goes through all these things this is the shortest uh, I will ever do this section but because I know that you're familiar with it and if not you can go back and you should familiarize yourself but bottom line he ends up exalted in a time of famine many years later decades pass but many years later they come and they bow down before him they don't even recognize him because he walks and talks and looks like an Egyptian and they don't but, but all of that to say, he was a dreamer. God gave him dreams, and then those dreams came to pass. And, and so um, we'll look at the last two when we get a little further down, because this is the last chapter we're looking at in the last section of the last chapter. So the penalty, by the way, the penalty for, as we and we just read it, for... Um, prophesying falsely or sharing a dream that that you know saying the lord gave me this dream and we should go worship that idol he's just saying uh, you know the lord who brought you out of Egypt, redeemed you from the house of bondage. If someone comes to entice you from the way the Lord commanded you to walk, you shall put away the evil from your midst, the penalty for leading people into idolatry away from the worship of the true and living God was death. And, and what he makes clear in this very next section, that's why we'll be able to get through it rather quickly. There's nothing to dwell on. There were no exceptions, even for family. And that's not what I think. That's what this says. Verse six says, if your brother, son of your mother, in case you don't know who your brother is, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, your friend who is as your own soul, so that'd be your best friend, secretly entices you saying, let us go and serve other gods. Aren't you tired of doing this thing, God's thing, his way? Let's see how the other guys do it, which you've not known, neither you or your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you. 
near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. You shall not consent to him or listen to him. You shall not, your eye shall not pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death. Afterward, the hand of all the people and you shall stone him with stones until he dies because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He's saying, whoever it is, they're leading you back to bondage and to the worship of God's small G that can never deliver and never provide and never protect. So all Israel, verse 11, shall hear and fear and not again do such wickedness as this among you. We know that those who were more religious than, than uh, righteous as far as their relationship with God, they had a knowledge of him, they claimed to love him and his word, but uh, we know that, that men like that stoned the apostle Paul, who used to be one of them. He used to be one that thought Jesus was not the Messiah, but of course, Jesus was the Messiah. He meets him on the Damascus Road. Now he's preaching that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's life eternal and everlasting forgiveness in him. Likewise, the woman taken in adultery, very different from Paul, but the same thing was happening. Jesus' enemies brought her, said she was caught in the act of adultery. They said, Moses says stoner. Yeah, we got that. What do you say? And if you don't know the story, Jesus knelt down and kind of wrote in the sand. Nobody knows what he was writing, but whatever it was from the eldest to the youngest, they began to leave one after another until the Lord asked her, hey, where are your accusers? Do none condemn you? And, and she says, no, no one. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Man, those words have to be, you know, some of the greatest you could ever hear. He didn't come to condemn but to save. He didn't come to condemn because we were already under condemnation, but to save us from our sins and save us from ourselves and save us from the condemnation that was due us. But he didn't just tell her, neither do I condemn you. That's half of the, 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 the uh, story. The other half, go and sin no more. And you never want to separate those two. You never want to say, well, God's not going to condemn me because saved by grace through faith. That's true. But, but he says, go and sin no more. We're not just saved from the penalty of our sin. We're saved from the power sin had over us. And he's saying, don't go back to your sin. If you hear someone, verse 12, in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives to you to dwell in, saying, corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of the city, saying, let us go serve other gods, if indeed it is true and certain, oh, which you've not known, then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain, that's the key, that such an abomination, and note that word, was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it. All that is in it, it's livestock with the edge of the sword. You shall gather its plunder into the middle of the street, completely burn it with fire and all the plunder for the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. These heaps become a, a powerful testimony in the Holy Land as people would travel and say, man, what's that? Oh, that used to be the city of. That used to be the town of. That's where these people got into idolatry. And this is the outcome of that idolatry. So none of the accursed things, verse 17, shall remain in your hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and multiply you just as he swore to your fathers. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God. To keep the commandments, which I command you to do this day. So, um, oh, so important, these things that he's saying to us, uh, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. So, um, prophets and dreamers, I'll give you a few things related to them because they are 
connected to signs and wonders. That's the fifth, fourth and fifth, sixth and seventh. So this will be quick and, and uh, you know, bullet point um, and with a couple things from Jesus. Because if he has something to say about this, we want to hear from him. I already mentioned there were two kinds of prophets, true and false, same is true today. Anyone can say, thus says the Lord, or the Bible says. You want to know, what does the Bible actually say? And is that something the Lord would say? (laughs) Because if it's contrary to his word, it's not him. So prophets and dreamers, because people are like, I have a dream. That was a good one, by the way. But uh, there will be others. The sixth sign, again, the sixth was signs. Signs point us to something greater. Road signs tell us that, you know, There's a curve ahead or you got to slow down here. They're for safety. These signs are to convince. They're to convince someone that, well, the Lord is the Lord and his word is his word. And false ones, again, they're going to try to take people away. The wonders are supernatural in nature. And John, in his gospel, uses seven signs and wonders to prove Jesus was the Christ. Let me read you John 20, verse 30. Jesus truly did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you you may have life in his name. So signs and wonders... Well, Jesus used them to confirm who he was, to bring, you know, peace to hurting people, health to to sick people and wounded people. He raised the dead. That's the ultimate sign, I would say. Uh, Second Thessalonians gives us the contrast, 2.9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Understand that Jesus used signs, and John testified of them, as did Peter and James and the others. But the enemy has always used signs. But he says power, signs, and lying wonders, 2 Thessalonians 2.10, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. That's it, see? They perish not because God didn't love them or because Jesus' blood couldn't cleanse them or buy their forgiveness or pay in full for their sins, but because they refuse to receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. In Revelation 12, 7, we find Michael and his angels at war with the dragon and his angels. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Lastly, Revelation 13, I'll give you just a couple of these. Two beasts, the first is the Antichrist, the second the dragon, who gives him power, a throne, and great authority. So men worship the dragon and the beast. The second The false prophet who performs great signs, bringing fire down from heaven, deceiving those who dwell on the earth by those signs. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He's not the first to do it. He'll just be the last. He causes all Revelation 13, 16, so you can look it up and confirm. This is what the scripture says. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark in the name of the beast or the number of his name, and that number is the number of, his man, of a man, and his number is six. Six, six. Lord, you have spoken clearly through your word tonight. I pray nothing I've shared has obscured, but that it would just shed further light and and connect dots for people still trying to put all this together and make sense of it all. Lord, we know that these warnings, these were, well, oh so important to Israel in that day and just as important to us in ours. We are living, we can see it, we're sure of it in the last days. You, you give us in Matthew 24 and, and Mark 13 and, and Luke, um, 
Luke 21, you give us the same pictures over and over and over, wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence and, and earthquakes in various places. And Lord, we know those have always occurred, but they're increasing with frequency and intensity, just as you said they would. And we know that Luke tells us when all these things begin to happen, look up, your redemption draws near. So Lord, keep our eyes on you. And when we're fearful and looking around or looking down, lift our eyes to heaven, Lord, and remind us that you're waiting there for us at your very throne, that nothing can happen to us, especially in the realm of life and death, that will be bad for us, Lord. We know that we'll breathe our last here, we'll shut our eyes and we'll open our eyes in your presence instantaneously with you, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And Lord, I pray if there'd be one or two or three or four or more who are here tonight or who are logged on or listening in tonight, and they've yet to give their life to you, surrender their life to you. They know some things about you, perhaps. They've believed in you, at least that you existed, and maybe even believe you died on a cross for the sins of mankind. But they have never appropriated the forgiveness that's available to them as we have. And if you're here or you're logged on or you're listening in and you've never said, Jesus, come into my life. I am a guilty sinner. I deserve death. I know that's the truth. But I hear that you're a gracious and merciful, forgiving and loving God. And I want to know you in a real and life transforming way. I want to surrender my life now to you. And then I want to live my life for you. And it all begins when you confess your sin and ask the Lord to be your Lord and your Savior. If you've never done it and you're ready to, raise your hand, hold it high. I'll pray with you. Not asking you to join our church. We don't have a membership. I'm asking you to be born again of the Spirit of God, as Jesus told Nicodemus. You must be born again, or you'll never see the kingdom of God. Never see the kingdom of heaven. So anyone this hour, anyone this evening, if here, please let us pray with you and give you a Bible and a hug and welcome you to the family of God. And if you're logged on or listening in, just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive my every sin. I believe in you. I embrace your forgiveness. I, I ask you to transform and use me to be a light in this dark and desperate season. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.